Good morning, church. Let's try it again. Good morning, church. All right, man. It is good to be in God's house. How good was that song? Man, dude. Dude, I love, I loved it. I, I, man, I, all services, I've been just sitting there, and it's just like, man, what a good message. And I love it because that's who we are. We're a church that, that we're a people. We're in this place where there's victory, right, where we as a people can say, not today, devil, you can get on out of here. And I, I just loved it. So, so yeah, uh, it sets us up for what God's going to speak. I know he's going to speak in a powerful way this morning, and I'm excited about what we're going to talk about. I want to remind you, if you have little kids, um, uh, and they begin to get loud for any reason, and if they're in the room, that is, um, if you could take them out of the room so we don't distract anybody from hearing from God, that would be so helpful um, as we uh, talk about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm excited because today we're going to have a bit of a family meeting. Now, uh, uh, for some of you, you might be like, ooh, family meeting, but uh, it's going to be good, all right? We're going to talk about um, the, a little bit of an update of the campaign that we had earlier this year. If you're new or visiting, um, or if you, you, maybe you missed it, we had a campaign called the I'm In Campaign uh, in May and June of this year, and it was a campaign for us as a church to take steps spiritually and to step out in faith and give and uh, we were just to raise money for the next steps that God was calling us to as a church, including um, some building uh, addition and some other things. I'm going to give you an update of where we are. We're now kind of five, six months removed from that, and so we're going to have a little bit of an update um, this morning, and I'm going to sprinkle in uh, a challenge from God's Word. So hopefully you're stoked um, for this, because I know I am. Where I want to start is uh, with a scripture passage that's going to kind of permeate the, the message this morning. And it's in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13. So uh, it'll be on the screen. You have Bibles. You can go there. We'll read it together. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Let me read it for you. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migrin. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, and he was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. Okay, all those names, you don't, there's not a test, okay? Uh, the thing that you need to know is Saul was under a pomegranate tree with his immediate army and the priests, and none of them knew that Jonathan had left, okay? On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, the other Sine. One cliff stood on the north toward Michmash, the other on the south toward Gib Giba, Geba. Again, you don't need to know that name specifically. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Today I want to talk on the topic, the power of what if. The power of what if. Turn to your neighbor and say, what if the sermon goes really long? <laughs> Tell that same neighbor, but yeah, what if it's really good? Yeah, okay, you're freaking me out, second service. I, I did not feel the love from that second one at all. They're like, no, we know it's just going to be long. Okay, so, hey, <laughs> can, can we pray together? Let's pray that God will speak to us. Heavenly Father, we come before you. I pray that in the next few moments, your spirit would move in a powerful way in this place. God, that we would um, see you in a new way. We would see or experience your love, and it would pierce our hearts, and it would change us. God, we need you to speak. We need you to give us ears to hear and uh, hearts to receive. So in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 What if? What if? What if is a powerful phrase. What if actually can be a, a burden kind of a phrase. What if? I, I think there's a lot of us probably maybe have this experience where we look back on our lives and we maybe look through a lens of maybe a little bit of shame or a little bit of regret and we'll say things like, what if? What if I hadn't bought that house? What if I hadn't bought that car? What if I had stayed in school? What if I had picked a different prof profession? What if that hadn't happened to me? What if I hadn't taken that drink? What if I hadn't married him? 
What if? It can be a powerful phrase. What if can uh, leave us with some burdens? So we looked at that text. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we find Saul under a pomegranate tree. Now, this is a really interesting place for him to be, and I want to give you some context as to why that's uh, important. So Saul's under the pomegranate tree. Saul is the king of Israel. That's God's people, God's chosen people, and Saul has been anointed to be their king. He's been chosen by God, and God has empowered him to lead. Now, up until 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul is a good king. And Saul is obedient to God. And Saul has seen the power of God work through him to defend the people of Israel. They've specifically against one enemy, the Philistines, which is a warring nation that was trying to um, enslave and overpower and overtake and overthrow the people of Israel. And so God had given, through his power, he'd given Saul victories over the Philistines to protect his people and expand their kingdom, and it was good. So, so Saul had seen God move. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, Saul got a, a little prideful. He got a little big for his britches, if you will. And Saul disobeyed a direct order from God. And he's basically what he said, he's like, I, you know, I don't need God's help this time. I'm good enough on my own. And basically, that's a sin, okay? So Saul sinned against God, and the prophet Samuel said to Saul, there's going to be consequences because you did this. This was not good. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we see Saul, and he's sitting under a pomegranate tree. He's sitting, on a pome or sitting under a pome pomegranate tree with his army and with his priests. That's not where they were supposed to be, okay? You need to get that picture. Because all around them were Philistines. All around them was a battle raging, a battle that God was calling them to fight. God was pointing them in that direction, but they're under a pomegranate tree. They're set up shop. It's like Saul is like basically sitting stuck in shame and regret. I should have never done that. What if I didn't do that? What if I hadn't? What if, what, what if right? And he's, so he's stuck under a pomegranate tree, not where he's supposed to be. He's in shutdown mode. Any, anybody ever go into shutdown mode? Right? You know what shutdown mode is. It's when you get all stressed out, or maybe you get to that place where you, something happened, and now you're in regret or shame or whatever, and so you go in your house, and you lock your door, and you order a couple pizzas and a couple things of ice cream, and you eat as much as possible. Maybe, maybe you watch all eight seasons of Walking Dead on Netflix. Yeah, maybe you sin a little bit. Go back to that sin that you're used to. That's shutdown mode. That's where Saul is. He's under the pomegranate tree in shutdown mode, and he's stuck. Everybody say stuck. stuck. All right, number one on your outline, fill this in. Regret, the regret and shame of what if can keep you stuck. The regret and shame of what if can keep you stuck. Many of you know exactly what that looks like, what that feels like. You're walking through life. What if this hadn't happened? What if I hadn't done this? What if? And it's keeping you from moving forward. It's keeping you from joy and peace and love and experiencing God. You can get stuck in what if. Let me tell you a story. A story about a little church in Medway, Ohio. Some of you know this story. So uh, in about 1850s, 1860s, somewhere around in there, I'm not exactly sure the, the time frame, uh, Medway was kind of a little like stopping post on the way from Dayton or Springfield to Dayton. And around there were these little farming, very small little farming uh, kind of chunks of people. And when the Methodist circuit rider would come through, uh, he established a couple, like two or three little church communities. And he would go and he would preach to those little church communities. He wouldn't want a lot of people. And that was kind of the, the early rumblings of what would become Medway Church. Well, the turn of the century, early... 1900s, those groups of people, they got together and they became Medway Church. And they put some sticks and some bricks together and made the first building that would house more than just these little family deals. Now it was a church, Medway Church. And people came and it was awesome and they got to see God move um, through that. Now, in the 1950s and 1960s, in the United States, there was a kind of a different feeling when it came to church. Almost everybody went to church. It was a cultural norm across the country for people to go to church. And that was represented at Medway Church. People, we had a lot of people coming to Medway Church. We had um, families and kids and old people, young people. And they were experiencing the power of God. There was energy. We were doing like choir concerts and bell choir stuff and, and inter interacting with the community around us. And it was really a cool time for Medway Church. Continue to grow and continue to see the power of God moving. 
Now, that lasted through the 70s, through the 80s, but around the 90s-ish, it started to experience some decline. There were some pastor changes that happened a couple of times. Some other issues happened. And bit by bit, the new people that were coming in the heyday, when they were seeing the power of God, I think the, the height of it was about 300 people at its absolute height. Bit by bit, though, those new people that were coming to Medway Church stopped coming. We stopped seeing new people. And so the congregation started to get older. They experienced some other turmoil with an, another pastor change, another couple of uh, internal issues. And then the regular people who were normally coming, they stopped coming as well. Or not all of them, but a lot of them. And they were starting to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it got to the point in the early 2000s where Medway Church, that had seen the power of God move, that had been around for over 100 years, it was looking like it was going to have to shut their doors because they were down to 50 people. The denomination said, we don't know if we can keep you uh, viable anymore, so we may have to close this building. Now, let me just, let me just rest in that for a second. I don't know that there is much more that hurts the heart of God than when a church, a body of Christ, people who have been can deeply connected with one another, when that dies, when that fizzles out. I mean, that's the bride of Christ. I mean, just think about how, how tough that would have been. All those people who had had their lives changed, who had seen the power of God move, and now they were going to have to shut the doors. That's where Medway Church was. They were stuck. Stuck, probably some regret, probably some shame. Well, if that, if that pastor hadn't come, or if that person hadn't done this, or what if, what if he had never been here? You, they're, they're stuck, just like Saul was stuck. And I think you, we need to understand, though, there's a, there's a different manifestation of the power of what if uh, that we run into. Because what if, a lot of times, goes to our regret, but I think sometimes what if goes to our future. People get stuck under uh, the what if of fear. Right? What, what if it doesn't work? What if we have to close the doors? What if God doesn't move? Number two on your outline. The fear of what if can keep you stuck. The fear of what if can keep you stuck. See, just like a lot of us will come into this place or experience times in our lives when we are stuck under the shame and regret of what if, I feel like all of us at some point, we get stuck under the fear of what if. What if I don't succeed? What if I put my out, myself out there and I get rejected? What if my marriage falls apart? What if, you know, it, the list goes on and on and on. What if I'll never get out of this addiction? What if I don't make it? What if I don't experience healing? What if, what if, what if, and it becomes this fear. That's where the church was. It's interesting. You look at this story with Saul underneath the pomegranate tree. He is stuck under there in shutdown mode, under the burden of what if. What if I hadn't done that? But he's also stuck under the burden of the fear. What if God won't move? What if the consequences of my sin means that we're going to get overtaken by the Philistines? What if? That's his side. That's, that's the way. That's, that's, his, that's what's keeping him stuck. It's his burden. It's the burden of what if. Now, the good part of the, about this story is that there is two characters in this story. You have Saul, who's under the burden of what if, but then you have Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is Saul's son. Jonathan is young. Jonathan, he's got the courage of the naive. Jonathan, he's a little bit wild. He's got a little bit of faith in God, and he's crazy enough to believe that maybe God will will work in power. Look at what he says to his armor bearer. He says, come, let's go over to the outpost of the uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will move or act in our behalf. Perhaps. Perhaps. His armor bearer. So the armor bearer doesn't have a name, so I've, the last couple services we've given him a, a name. And so I like Dale. All right, so Dale. That's his name. Uh, she's like, Dale, let's go over to the uncircumcised men. Come on, let's go. There's battles going on. Saul's sitting down. He is not doing what God called him to, but Dale, come on. Perhaps. Maybe, just maybe God will move. He's basically saying, Dale, what if we go over, you and I, what if we go over to where God's pointing, and what if God moves? What if we go and God does something special? What if? That's Jonathan's what if. Now, here's the thing. Number three on your outline. Fill this in. This is the crux of this whole message, right? God can change our what if from fear and regret to courage and his power at work within us. God can change our 
fear, our regret, that, that what if, he can take the burden of what if, and if we, and like that Saul what if, and he can turn it into a Jonathan what if that says, what if God, what if God can do something huge, what if God can work through me, what if God can do a healing, what if God, that's the kind of what if we want to have, that's the kind of what if God can give us through Jesus. So, Medway Church, we're at 50 people. Maybe going to shut down the doors, put a padlock on them, disband that local body. There was a handful of people here at Medway Church, just, just a few, not, not all 50, just a few of them, um, where God changed their what if. Every, everybody, everybody was, what if, God, what, if God, what if God doesn't move anymore? What if we can't? What if, the, you know, but there was a few of them that they got a Jonathan kind of what if. They got in the power of what if, and they said, what if God could do a work here? What if God's not done with us? What if God can do a revival at Medway Church? And so they started to beg and pray and say, God, please do something. God, help us be faithful. God, please work in this place. And so they're they're fighting for it and praying for it. And well, the denomination was going to shut the doors, but they said, well, they got a couple people who are probably uh, good to go, so let's give it one last shot. And so the denomination put together a bit of a plan. They got a big church, a healthy church involved. It's called Gingsburg Church. It's just down the road from here. They were a healthy, growing church. And so their leadership came and uh, interacted with our church leadership, and they were going to help us find a pastor. And so they were looking all over the place, all over the nation, for a pastor that had experience, like reviving a church, and that was educated and, and just like an, the A-game guy, right? The Peyton Manning, if you will. Looking for, for a good pastor to put at Medway Church so they can take off again. Well, there was a, uh, several months of meetings, lots of meetings going on where uh, the bring in a candidate or talk about a candidate or this is what we need to be ready for and different leaders and stuff. And after a few of those meetings, a guy started to come to the meetings and he would sit in the corner and he kind of looked out of place. And he's a guy by the name of Mike. Now, you know where this is going. So Mike, Mike has his own what if story. See, Mike, and he, if you've been to our church, you've, you've heard him tell the story. Mike has a, uh, a history of being uh, in recovery. He was uh, addicted to alcohol, and there was a point in his life where his what if, he was under the burden of what if. He said, what if, what if this kills me? What if I can't ever stop? But God changed his what if, and he said, well, what if, with the help of God, I could get sober? And God did. And said, what if God could heal my marriage? And God did. And then what if uh, I could maybe serve and be a part of, a part of uh, God using me at church? And then God did. And then he did a 12-step group. And, God, and then God did. And then he got this crazy idea of like, what if that church down there, what if God's calling me to be a pastor over there? What if? What if God could use me? He doesn't have any formal education. He doesn't have, a, he, as a, he was a civil engineer. And so he was going to take a pay cut if this thing worked out. So he said, well, what if God could use even me, guy in recovery? And so he went to the leaders who were involved with putting uh, the pastor in place. They remember, they're looking for Peyton Manning. Uh, <laughs> I love that that is where I went. Anyways, um, <laughs> so they're looking for the A-game guy. And Mike's like, I-, I feel like God's calling me. And they're like, yeah, he's probably not. That's, they didn't think that was right. But he kept pushing, and they said, fine, you can come to the meeting. And they'll just stay over there like, you too, little buddy. Come on, right? Um, little did they know that God had other plans in mind. So God ordained the process, and Pastor Mike came to be the pastor at Medway Church. And at first, it was, it was trying. It was tough. And there was 50 people. They had to argue through. Do we change the way we worship? Do we change the way our building looks? They had to have argue, fights and arguments over pews and air conditioning and uh, where, how to do different uh, ministries and things like that. And people left. Some, some people said, you, you know, we're not into this. But bit by bit, bit by bit, that what if God could move began to permeate the people at Medway Church? What if God could use us? What if God could do something huge? And so they started to get a little crazy, and they're like, well, what, if, what if we made our church a place anybody could come to, that no matter what they were wearing or what they've been through or where they come from, they would feel welcome in this place, like, so that new, just new people could come. And they're like, well, no, no, nobody new is coming to our church right now. But they're like, but what if God would bring new people? 
So the church, they started to get that mentality. What if we could develop a kids ministry that impacted the lives of children? Like, we don't have any kids coming. Well, but what if God would bring some? We're going to be ready. And so they started to fight for it. They started to do anything they could think of to try to reach new people. They would march in the Memorial Day parade. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen the Medway Memorial Day Parade. It's like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And just right up underneath there is the Medway Memorial Day Parade. Uh, there, there's no balloons uh, uh, there. But we marched in it and we passed out candy and invited people to church. We had a bread ministry that we invite. We go to door to door, invite people to our church. And we had popcorn outside the sanctuary. So people get popcorn when they came in. Anything we could do to reach people for Jesus. We say, if God, what if God would move? What if we did this and God brought new people? And he did. And bit by bit, the church started to grow. And over the course of a couple years, it went from 50 people down to 30 people, but back up, God started to move and it grew to 175 to 200 people. And that's where I come into the story because I wasn't there for the first part of the story. I came in about two years after Mike came. And Mike, uh, or excuse me, I have my own what if story. I was serving at a church uh, before Medway, a healthy, growing church. I loved being a part of that church, love them still. Uh, I was there for six years, I met my wife there, we got married there. Um, so Julie and I had been serving there together for a while, we loved it. And on the last year of our time at that church, uh, we were a part of a major ministry kind of opportunity, and it didn't go the way we wanted it to go. And so at the end of that time, it really nobody's fault, but I was left on the outside looking in, where they, they didn't have a space for me anymore. And so I was walking away from that church very wounded. I just, it, it, my feelings were hurt and stuff. And so I had, was going through my own, like, what if? I'm like, what if God's not called me to ministry? What if I picked the wrong career? What if I've put, you know, 10 years of my life into this, and it it's, wasn't what I was supposed to do? What if? What if I'm not gifted to be a worship leader that, that was where I was at and so Julie and I we were leaving that spot and we were looking for what the next step was we didn't know what it really what we were going to do we we're a couple of different options and we stumbled across Medway Church and we decided we would come down and visit God kind of worked it out that Julie had a friend that lived right down the road so we came down and we came to Medway Church and the moment we stepped foot in this place we realized that there was something special in this place and what we saw was a group of people filled with a what if God kind of mentality, the Jonathan kind, the what if God would move, and we saw it. And I told, I'm telling you, like the moment I came in, my what ifs, all of those negative what ifs, were turned on their head. What if God could do something huge? What if God could move? What if God? I saw it, and it, it had an impact on me. So Julie and I went home. We we said, okay, should we go down there? Well, what if it doesn't work out? But no, no, we, we think we could do it. So we left the house. It was unsellable. And so this is like a big, massive burden. Left our friends and family. Came down to Medway Church to say, what if God could move? Well, over the course of the next several years, God continued to bring people. We continued to try just about anything we could to bring people into the church. And God continued to bring people. Then we got a crazy idea. What if what if we sacrificed financially? What if we as a church, there's about 200, 250 of us, what if we gave above and beyond the tithe that God's called us to, what if we gave a little bit more? Maybe we could build a, a building a little bit bigger, a little bit more accessible for people that we could reach even more people for Jesus. And so we all came together, we prayed about it, we sacrificed, and we gave a little bit above and beyond. And sure enough, we raised like Two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars right out of the chute. Just a couple, you know, two hundred and fifty people. It was awesome, miraculous that God worked in his people. And so we bought land, which is this land. It was a drive-in movie theater. We bought it. And right after we bought it, the economy tanked. Like, whoosh, we weren't gonna be able to build. We were freaked out a little bit. This was an opportunity for us as a church to crawl back under the pomegranate tree. Right? We could have, but we didn't. Instead, we doubled down. And we said, can we give some more? And so people gave up some vacations. People gave up a little bit of their retirement and said, we're going to try to give to be able to build. And God did a miracle. We were able to build the first phase of the building for pennies on the dollar. It was an absolute miracle that what we were able to build. And so we built that. We opened it on an Easter Sunday and like uh, double the attendance the first week. It was awesome. We got in there. We saw God move. A couple years later, God continues to bring people, continues to, to, to take our what-ifs, takes what we're trying, and, and continues to move in a powerful way. And 
We get, uh, I guess three, four years ago, we had a, another campaign. We said, what if God could use us if we gave again? What if we stepped out and sacrificed above and beyond? Um, what, what if we really started to try to reach the next generation? So it was called the Next Campaign. And so we built, uh, we brought in a whole bunch of money. We built the room you're sitting in now. Uh, this sanctuary was an addition to, uh, after the Next Campaign. This sanctuary was actually only about 30% bigger than our previous sanctuary. The bigger deal was not this space. It was that this space could expand in the future. These walls can get, get bigger, get wider. But we, during the next campaign, more than doubled our children's and student ministry capacity, which is awesome. That was a really cool part of that campaign. So we did it. God moved. God continued to bring more people. It's awesome. This year, we're starting to feel God tugging on us again. It's like, there's a battle out there. You guys got to go. Okay, what if, what if we got people together and we decide to give again? What if we tried to sacrifice? What if we challenged people in their faith to take steps, to go all in? What if, what, what if we, we would just take another step and what if God would move? And that's where we were uh, in May and June. And do you know that us as a church, we raised over $700,000 during that campaign? Wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. It was awesome. That was money pledged over the next three years. And so uh, in that campaign, we challenged everybody to take a step spiritually. Like to, if you're here and you haven't stepped in, a, get in a small group. If you haven't gotten a God, get a God. We were, there was a major step spiritually, but a major element of that was that giving. And I don't know if you remember, if you missed the I'm in campaign, you can go back and watch it online. Um, just go back to where it says I'm in. But we had steps on the stage that we talked about the uh, giving levels, and that for us as Christians, our starting point bar, the thing that we're shooting for as being our starting point is a tithe, 10% of our income. That's what we step into to, to begin the journey of trusting God with our finances, but then the, uh, the upper level, the next level is what we call primal giving. That's the what if giving. That is the what if I go above and beyond. What if God could use this for something huge? What if God would use me? And so that's what we challenged everybody. So today, what I want to do is I give you a little bit of an update. What do we do with that $700,000 pledged? Uh, and so I'm going to show you uh, what we've done. We've talked to a bank. We've talked to builders. We've gotten our heads together. And we have come up with some plans for some addition to our building. Would you like to see the plans? Okay, yes. All right. Let's go ahead and put the first picture on there. Now, uh, during the first service like last night. I was trying to point to stuff from down here, but my arms aren't long enough. So somebody got me a laser pointer. Hey, yeah, that's awesome. Technology. Uh, all right. So over here, that's the octagon. That is uh, where we eat breakfast. If you eat breakfast, that's the front doors, side doors. We are up there somewhere, right? Uh, it's not on this picture. So this is our children's area. This is where the lines extend in the children's area. Uh, this is, doesn't exist yet. That's an addition. That specifically is going to double the capacity for children's ministry. We're going to add a whole lot of space. That is, that's the most exciting and important piece of, of this phase of building. That, that is huge. Up here, when, when kids walk in, it is going to look uh, like the coolest thing they've ever been a part of. That is going to pop, and because we want kids to get excited about it. And we've seen it happen at our church where the kids get excited, and then they bring their parents, and then they bring it and they stay because the kids love it. And so that's huge. We're going to um, re kind of condition the, chil the existing children's wing. We're going to tear that up a little bit so that we can have wider hallways, so that we can have better flow to go in there. And we are going to uh, basically get rid of those lines. Can I have a hallelujah? hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's the, the huge, cool thing for the children's ministry. All right, go ahead and show me the next slide. Uh, okay, over here. We are here. I am right there, okay? Uh, this right here has not been uh, added yet, but that's what we we're planning to add. We're going to expand the, the sanctuary out those directions so that we can accommodate for some more seating and we're going to expand the lobby area to accommodate for more people coming in they can be welcomed we can interact with them without feeling um, cramped um, because we're all about new people um, the expansion of this room will give us the the capabilities to kind of over a series of steps as we get larger we can add more and more and more chairs um, to this place and it, almost to, to double what the amount of chair capacity in the end which is awesome now you, uh, you may think, why do we need more chairs? 
Why do we need more chairs? Now, we got to thinking about, you know, the, just, just a chair, right? Just a chair. Whenever we're not in here and we take the chairs up, we put them in the closet. They just sit there. But when they're here and when people are sitting in the chairs, when somebody new comes into this place and they sit in the seat, it's not just a chair now. This is now a space where they are going to hear the love of Jesus, where their lives may be forever changed. So, you know, for us as a staff, we've done this periodically as pastors, and my small group has done this, where we've come into this area, this space, and we've just prayed over every chair that whoever sits there would be impacted by the love of God. It's more than just a chair. This is an opportunity. It's a seat toward heaven, a seat toward hope, a seat toward freedom. It's huge, and we are excited about being able to be a part of reaching our community and reaching our city and reaching the world, and it's going to happen by us expanding and continuing to trust God. What if all of those seats got filled up? What if God moved? All right, let's go ahead and look at this last one. If you own a helicopter and fly over Medway Church, that's what it's going to look like from above. It's cool, right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. I am stoked um, about how we're going to see it expand. But I have some good news and I have some bad news. Which would you like to hear first? <laughs> so wait, wait. Somebody was up here. They're like, good news. And everybody said bad. And they're like, no, 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 bad. I mean the bad. So they changed. You, you convinced them. The power of the power of the community. Yeah, the bad news. Bad news is construction doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't. It takes a while. Uh, the schedule for a building addition for this for us is a 10-month deal. So from the moment we break ground to when we're done, it's going to take about 10 months um, to get done. That is a long time. That is going to be 10 months of dirt getting in the way where we're going to have a bit of upheaval as far as where you can come in and entrances and it's going to look a little janky and the parking lot. Oh, I forgot to tell you. We're doing the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> I did last service. I, last service I forgot too and everybody went nuts. Yeah, we're totally, we're adding parking. We're going to resurface it. That'll happen at some point where we'll have good parking and not potholes and everything else. All right. So in the 10 months though, the bad news is, is that it's going to be a little hectic, a little crazy. We're going to need everybody's help to be patient, everybody's help to welcome people when they come in, everybody's help to just make up for the fact that it's going to be uh, a little disheveled um, during those 10 months. Mike and I, we interact with different pastors and different churches, that, like big healthy churches and their leaders. And uh, one of the things that we heard when we told some of them that we were building from a, several different people who had been part of building projects at a church, they all said kind of the same thing. They're like, be careful, because a lot of times when you build, when the physical stuff during those 10 months or however long it takes, you lose momentum. There's a good chance that people will kind of stay home for those things. And so and it's kind of bad news. But uh, let me just tell you the good news. The good news is we at Medway Church, uh, we are not under the burden of what if people stop coming and what if people, you know, we lose momentum. We are a what if God can move kind of church. And so yeah, during that 10 months, so it's like, what if God can actually bring more people to this place while it's disabled? What if God can empower us as a church to step into serving, to up our game so that we can overcompensate for those things with servants who are loving on people with, with uh, and helping direct people and, and, and new folks come in and, and they don't even see any mess of construction and God moves. So there's actually good news in there. But the other piece of good news is that we have commenced construction already. We, uh, everybody's like, what? Uh, so we have to go ahead, we sign the contracts, we should see dirt moving within the next couple of weeks. And so um, that is awesome. Even last week we had the guys outside with the little telescope thing kind of looking across. And so we're, we're moving. Uh, so it's happening, and I'm just stoked about it. I really am. So that's the update. That's where we're at as a church. Um, we need everybody's help. We really do. When it starts to, we start moving dirt, we start to tear up stuff, it, there's going to be times when it is a little bit uh, hectic, and we're going to need your help, okay? Uh, I'm excited, though. I'm excited that God's going to move. All right. Let me just give you a challenge from a spiritual perspective. That, Saul, that, that story of Saul and Jonathan, you got Saul underneath the pomegranate tree, all, he's not where he's supposed to be. There's a battle raging outside, and he's under the pomegranate tree, under the burden of what if. We have Jonathan. He's, he's crazy enough to believe, what if God can move? You got the, those two people. So I think when it comes to church, a group this size, I think there's some people here this morning, and you are under the wrong side of what if. 
You come into this place and what if is not a, a freeing thing, it's not a power thing, you're under the burden of what if. You come into this place with a little guilt and shame of where, what you've done, where you're from, some regrets in your life. What, what if this hadn't happened? What if I hadn't taken that step? What if this looked different? Maybe you're in, in a place where you're afraid. What, what if God doesn't move? What if he can't heal my family? If you're in that place, let me come back to point number three. God can change your what if. He proved it, that he sent his son Jesus to die for you and me, to take all that guilt, all that shame, all that regret. That's the message that we've seen in our church. We've seen the power in our church. That's the message that we bring. That's the gospel, is that you, whatever what if you're carrying, God can take that and put it in the grave, and when he resurrected, that set us free from all of that to change our what if. And so if you were coming into this place, maybe you could hear for the first time through the power of the Spirit that Jesus loves you. You don't have to carry that what if anymore. And maybe, whatever it is, I, I don't know, if you're, if you're in that place, whatever your what if is, maybe you could change it. Instead of what if God doesn't move, but maybe what if God could work in my marriage? What if God could heal my relationship with my kids? What if God could set me free from addiction? What if I give God a year and he moves in my life in a powerful way? God could change your what if. All you have to do is give it to him and then get busy. Get going. When Jonathan tells his armor bearer, remember Dale? All right? He tells his armor bearer, come, let's go. Where do they go? He says, let's go to the camp of the uncircumcised, the outpost of the uncircumcised. What's that mean? Those are the Philistine guys, but that specifically means the people that don't know God. He says, come on, let's go to where God's not known. Come on, let's go to where they don't understand who he is or his blood or his power or his work or his hope or his goodness. Let's go to the, those who don't know God. If your what if is on the wrong side, you give it over to him, but then you go. You get busy. You do the best you can and let God do the rest. I got one last thing. I'm going to have the band come on up here. And we're going to worship in a second. Um, but I, I, I want to give you a challenge. So in your bulletins uh, are the cards that we used for the uh, I'm In campaign. Uh, if you weren't here for that or you missed out on being a part of that, we put those in there so you could be reminded of what we did. But also, um, if you wanted to participate, if you're like, you know what, I didn't participate then or I'm new or whatever, we would love for you to join. We'd love for you to be a part of that. We'd love for you to say, what if God could use me? What if God could take my gift? And so if you want to... Do, Fill out, pledge, um, put it in the boxes. We'd love it. If you haven't shared your story, we would love for you to share your story uh, with us. We heard, we got hundreds of stories bef before of just how God's moved. Share it with us. It, it, it's awesome. It's inspiring. So as we were preparing for this update, and as I was studying through and looking at the story of Saul and Jonathan, um, and thinking about how God moved through the capital campaign and the challenge, I got to thinking about how God changed my what if. You know, instead of what if, you know, I couldn't do it, or what if God wasn't moving, he changed it to what if, just what if God moves. And we, that's our church's, it's the history. On this side of what if is funny, because I think about, like, before I gave, it was like, what if I can't make ends meet? Or what if I can't, it was this kind of fear thing, or what if I can't, on this side of giving, I look back, and I'm like, what if I hadn't given? What if I hadn't been a part of, uh, a step out. I probably have a couple of extra TVs now. I probably have an upgraded car, maybe a nicer house. I probably would have. I weigh that against what we've seen God do. It's crazy. Just think about it. what if we hadn't been a part? What if we hadn't stepped out in faith? What if we hadn't given? So, what if in the story of Medway Church, that handful of people of the 50, what if they hadn't stayed? What if they had bailed? What if they hadn't said, God, you've changed our what if. What if you moved? What if they hadn't held on and tried and tried and tried? What if they hadn't? You know that there were over 2,000 people at Easter last, last year? It's so huge. What if Pastor Mike hadn't come? What if he hadn't taken a pay cut? What if he hadn't had the courage to say, I I'm called? What if he hadn't come? We have almost 1,000 people here on a weekly basis. It's so huge. What if Julie and I hadn't come? What if we hadn't uh, left our family behind and come down here? We have over 30 
small groups of people who are developing disciples, who are soaring for Jesus or moving to grow to soar for Jesus. It's awesome. What if the church had, didn't say, you know what, we're going to challenge the way we've done worship and the way we've done church and what we dress and all that stuff that, made, that we were comfortable with. What if, what if they didn't do that? You know, we had over 400 kids at VBS this year. That's a huge deal. What if, what if we hadn't given on those capital campaigns? What if we hadn't taken the step in faith and saying, God, what if, what if you'll move? What if we hadn't stepped out? You know, we've had over 500 people baptized in this place. That is a huge deal. And if you've ever been here during, during a baptism service, it is a special service. And there is very rarely a dry eye in the place. Why? Because every time someone comes up out of the water, that represents a life that has been changed and has been made new and has been made alive with the hope that's in Jesus Christ. And so whenever we have those services, what if we didn't give? We would have missed it. We would have missed out on what God's doing. We would have missed the power of God at work in this place. We would have missed his power. Let me just read these. So I told you we got a whole bunch of stories. Can I just share you a couple stories that we got during the last capital campaign? I think this will be good. What What if we hadn't done it? I was invited to Medway by my sister over four years ago. I finally took her up on the offer four Easter's ago. The night before, I stayed up doing cocaine all night. I only got one hour of sleep, and then I came to church. I knew I was home as soon as the worship started. I could feel the presence of God here. I've never been the same since I came to Medway. My life has changed completely. I got plugged into a small group and have grown tremendously. I'm home. My name, no, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. I could talk about my past and all of my problems. Listen to this. That's not my story today. Today I'm a radical follower of Jesus. I'm the hand and feet of Jesus today on this world. I'm a mother to two beautiful young daughters that Jesus blessed me with. I'm a mother who now prays with my children and blesses them every night. I'm a wife who prays that God, to God that I can be a living testimony, an example of how the power of God can change our whole life from the inside out. I'm a wife who prays that my alcoholic husband will turn his life over to God, and until then, I will continue to come to church without him. Today, I'm a disciple of God. I pray daily for God to use me in any way and for any purpose that pleases him. Today, I strive to strengthen my spiritual relationship with God and to follow his will for me and to fill my purpose for God. Today, I am a child of God, and I am in. How cool is that? How cool is that? What if, what if we hadn't stepped out? Can I ask you something? What if God wants to use you? What if God wants to do a work in you? What if God wants to unleash his power in you? Church, I don't know if you know this, but there's a battle raging outside of these walls. We see it all over. We're struggling. Our world is struggling with addiction. People are dying. Broken families, motherless children, fatherless children. We see it on the news. There's shootings. There's racism. You name it. There is a battle going on, and I believe that God is looking from heaven. He said, I'm looking for a church that will get out from under the pomegranate tree and go over to the uncircumcised group, to go to the people who don't know Jesus. And church, you and I, We are brothers and sisters. If you know Jesus, we are brothers and sisters, and we are bound by the blood of Jesus. We are set free by the power of his resurrection, and we are set forth in this Holy Spirit's power to reach the world. And I tell you what, church, we will be a church that gets out from under the tree, and we are going to continue to go to the lost and go to the hurting and go to the broken. And just like Jonathan told his armor bearer, just like he told old Dale, he says, come on. Let's go. And old Dale, he said, I'm with you, heart and soul. He said, I'm in. I hope you're in because God's going to do a work in us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that in the next few moments, we're going to praise your name. We're going to worship. And God, I pray that you would just remind us deep in our souls that we are a what if people. What if you will move? And God, I pray that we would see your power unleashed in this place. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can Can we stand? We just sing there is power in the name of Jesus. Let's sing it out, declare it. There is power. Do you believe it, church? There is power.
song. He says there's an armor ra- army rising up. That's who we are. There's a battle raging. We are an army that's rising up. I just want to declare it. Let's just declare it together and we'll sing out. There's an army. There's an army rising. Go ahead and sing that out. There's an army. There's an army rising up. Let's sing it louder, church. Come on. There's an army. What if God wants to use you? What if God wants to do a work in you? What if God's not done with this place? I promise you he's not. Next week, we are kicking off a very, very important sermon series. It's going to be powerful. I'm excited about it. I can't, I can't stress it enough. It's going to be one of the more impactful sermon series that we've had in a long time. You're going to want to bring people to it, okay? So invite somebody. Bring them in here. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. God bless you.